Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, 4 p.m. on a given Monday. Bill Sharp is flying around somewhere. I'm Jay Fidel. We're having Think Tech Asia today. And we, have, we are delighted to have uh, Liam Kelly and his wife, Lei uh, Ha, uh, Fan, or Fan Lei Ha, yes. better put. Okay, both of them are into Vietnam. Um, uh, Liam is uh, in the department, in the history department at UH Manoa. Uh, and, uh, F Fan? Fan Lei Ha, yeah. Uh, all three names. Yeah. Fan, Fan, Lei, <laughs> Fan, Fan Lei Ha yeah. is in the Department of Education, the College of Education. Yes. But they're both uh, heavily involved in Vietnam, been that way for a long time. Can, can you tell me about, uh, Liam, welcome to the show. Mm -hmm, thank you. Uh, can you tell me about uh, your, you know, your CV, uh, how you got to where you are in the history department? Wow. Sure. Um, I came, actually, I have my MA and PhD from UH Manoa. I came here in the 90s to study Chinese history. Um, then I, somewhere along the way, I came to realize that um, the Vietnamese used to write in classical Chinese before the 20th century. And so if you can read that, you can research old Vietnamese history. And so I essentially found a way to research about Vietnam, even though I was getting a degree in Chinese history. And uh, that then led to a position where I now teach Vietnamese history and Southeast Asian history at UH Manoa. Uh, but along the way, I studied Vietnamese. I've spent you know, a lot of time in Vietnam. And now I consider Vietnam to be my main area of focus and, and no longer China. Yeah, and hence your remarks on Thursday last week at the mm -hmm. China Seminar. A number of my friends were there and said okay. it was really great. Okay. It's really great. Great. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm good for you for go, for speaking there. That was actually a special moment because the uh, the founder of the China Seminar, uh, Professor Danny, Danny Kwok, Kwok, is my PhD advisor. Was oh, that so right? So that was kind of like a homecoming. It's been the the China Seminar has been going on for 41 years. I think I got my PhD 17 years ago, so it took him 17 years to invite me, but he finally did it, and I was happy <laughs> he to do it. He came around. <laughs> <laughs> now you've arrived. Yeah, eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Fan Lei, can you tell me about your CV and uh, what, what you're doing in the College of, Engin of, um, uh, of Education? Education, yes. So um, I am from Vietnam, uh, from Hanoi, Vietnam, and I received my education in both Vietnam and Australia. So actually, before moving to UH Manoa, I had been working at uh, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Mm. And so since I moved to UH Manoa in 2014, I have been, um, you know, I have been with the Department of Education of Foundations in the College of Education and uh, specializing in um, globalization, I mean, uh, internationalization and globalization of, edu of higher education, and also um, doing a lot of work with sociology of knowledge and knowledge production. And I've been doing lots of uh, research in different parts of the world. Of course, Vietnam, Vietnam is one, but also in Australia, Southeast Asian countries, and the Middle East. Oh, yes. Middle East, too, <laughs> the whole area. Yes. Well, you know, we see Asia as going way west. Yeah. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Think Tech Asia includes a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, you guys have a conference that you do together. And you had a show with us, was it last year, with Grace Chen? Right. Um, and uh, you talked about that conference. Uh, can you talk about what is that conference, why are you doing the conference, who comes to the conference, and so forth? Mm -hmm. That conference is Leha's baby. She's the real okay. founder of it. So we'll, we'll let Leha, her start, and then I'll pick up on, on anything else that she leaves out. All right, fair. Yeah. Um, so in 2009, when I was still working at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, I uh, started an initiative called Engaging with Vietnam. Um, so basically, I wanted to create, um, like, you know, a playing field for all those interested in Vietnam to come together to share their work, and you know, and we we want to bring people from different disciplines, um, and you know, to engage in Vietnam from a very complex, sophisticated, non-dichotomous menu. <laughs> yes, and then the um, engaging with Vietnam initiative has its annual um, academic conference series, and we every year we 
have the conference in one location, and we have been partnering with different institutions and organizations in Vietnam, in Australia, in the United States, and our latest partner is in the Netherlands ah, to wow. yeah to organize a conference. Mm -hmm. And knowledge <coughs> production has been the core part of uh, engaging with Vietnam, and uh, this year is a very important year for us because it is a tenth anniversary of engaging with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Liam has, in a, since 2011, has been joining me to uh, co-develop engaging mm -hmm. with Vietnam. So, you want yeah, to so talk the, about I that? mean, one of the things that's unique about it is that the conference usually moves from one country to another. So mm -hmm. it's usually one year in Vietnam, one year outside of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, what really attracted me to it originally is that um, because of globalization and all the changes that are taking place in Vietnam, you have a growing cohort of Vietnamese who are studying overseas. Uh, but now we're also seeing Vietnamese who are studying in country who are really reaching impressive levels. And so every year at this conference, you meet just young people on the rise who you never could imagine. And that numbers are just growing and growing. It's really exciting. Mm. Yeah, and, and actually also related to uh, Liam's recent seminar on the Sino-Vietnam relation. Mm. Uh, you know, there are thousands of Vietnamese students studying in China at the moment, you know. So yeah, just, they're just, everywhere. just yeah, before right. this yeah. talk, you know, we, yeah. we br briefly talk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, um, so at the moment, uh, we have probably 15 to 16,000 Vietnamese students studying in the United States. Uh, about a similar number in Australia and yeah, and many in China, for example. So yes, so a lot of educational activities and collaborations have been taking place between Vietnam and China. Yeah, and they're all yeah. achievers too, aren't they? they are. uh, yeah. Yes, they're all yes. high yes. energy achievers. I, yes, I, I, yeah. I don't know any exception to that rule. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so when is the conference? When can I go this time? How soon? And what, what, what should I do? This time, um, it's going to be in December. Right. Uh, so, like I said, usually we move from inside Vietnam and outside. We had it in 2016 here in Hawaii, mm. 2000, the end of 2017, early mm. 2018, in last Vietnam. year in Vietnam. But we had yeah. such a good time last year, in and it was Vietnam. such an amazing conference because we moved from Ho Chi Minh City to two other places in Anzan the South. And yeah. And it was just, it was fantastic. And so we want to do that again. And so it will be yeah. this December 15th to 21, we'll have the conference yes. again in Vietnam. And yeah. also the 10th anniversary, we really yeah. want to have it in Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we expect to have the conference held in two locations. Ah, uh, on two yeah. locations. Yeah. Yes. A lot of people come? Yes. Yeah. And, and what, what kind of uh, uh, agenda do you agenda, have, what kind of yeah, yeah. programs do you have within the conference? Yeah, this so um, one of the things that's unique about the conference is um, it's basically designed so that people can enjoy or will enjoy going to everything. So there are a lot of big conferences these days where people kind of parachute in, they give their paper, and then they, they leave. But the way this one is set up is we have a theme for the conference. There are keynote talks that everyone goes to that address the theme from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. Then there are breakout sessions where um, you know, people give their individual papers. But the keynote speakers chair the breakout sessions. Then we, you know, we have a lot of talk shows. And even the keynote sessions can be like talk shows. Um, panel discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and um, then we've had like a, last year, one of the focuses is, was uh, well, we were focusing on tourism, sustainability, and development, and heritage. We had an evening at this new boutique hotel that used a lot of materials from an old shipyard to create a sense of the past. Mm -hmm. So we went there, had a dinner, we met with the architect and the owners to talk about the, the logic behind all of this. We went out into a, the provinces to see how tourism, sustainability, and development are oh, put into that. practice there. We continued the conference out there. So it's really the type of conference where you go, you stay the whole time, and people do this. Yes. And you want to take a guess how many days this conference was? Last year, nine days. Nine days. Oh, that's a long conference. Wow. But it was fun. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. And, yeah. and we are determined to do it again this year, yeah. at yeah. least seven days. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Vietnam is in a happy time now, isn't yes. it? Yes. Mm -hmm. The economy is good. Mm -hmm. um, people are you know, becoming globalized. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that true? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, true. But of course, there are, I mean, um, like 
any other places in the world, opportunities come with problems, issues, sure. dilemmas, paradoxes. Sure. And that invite a lot of, you know, um, policy and practice mm -hmm. conversations. And yeah. yes, and, and, and that is why our, our Engaging with Vietnam conferences, we believe, you know, are important uh, in addressing those issues and in mm -hmm. inviting and bringing people together to come up with interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary dialogues to address, mm -hmm. yeah. It's been remarkable since the Vietnam War. It really has. And you, you almost wonder, I hesitate to say this, but you almost wonder that the war, that things wouldn't have been so good now without the war then. Uh, disagree with that? Uh, debatable. <laughs> debatable, but things would not have been so dramatic, that's for sure. And yeah. so one of the things I talked about in this talk last week was about how society has changed so much. And um, the one generation that just continues to amaze me is the one that's um, Leha's generation. So imagine, if you will, you know, you were born right after the war. You live in the 80s, the hardest time in Vietnam. There's no food. Everything, you know, is is difficult. Uh, but education still works. They're still get, got great literacy, math, sciences. Everyone's getting that. And literature, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and <laughs> and foreign languages. Yeah, and then the country starts to open a bit in you know by the late 80s with this policy of doi moi. The 90s then, What's uh, the, reform, that was their renovation. reform or Economic. renovation, that was the name of their policy in 1987, okay. right? And so then in the 90s, you get people who are in university who then go on to, you know, who, like, let's see where they are today. Today, they're, they have their road, they're the CEOs of telecommunications companies. In the 1990s, there were not many landlines in Vietnam. They're the head of IT companies, multinational IT companies, no. the head of law firms that deal with clients from around the globe. That transition is yeah. incredible. And so, around the world, Yeah, too. right, yeah. <laughs> and so without a war, they would be there now, but you wouldn't see that dramatic, you know, yeah. transformation. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, every, <clears throat> every international conference I go to, I find Vietnamese people there. To, right, And yeah. they're actively involved in it, and they're yeah. mm, achievers. Yeah. So, um, one of the, you know, one of the things of interest here is, um, you know, the economy. And uh, uh, I had a client, I, I used to be a lawyer. Yeah. Mm, okay. I had a client yeah. who had invested. He was from the South Pacific. He was European descent. And he had, an, um, no, actually he was Chinese descent. He had invested in, in Honolulu. And one day he said to me, I'm cashing it all in. I'm selling everything and I am reinvesting in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> this was in the, um, I guess, the late 80s, early 90s. And I thought, okay, that's wow. an interesting wow. That was daring. Okay, yeah. And he made much more money there okay, than okay. he would have made here. Okay, okay. You know? <laughs> mm. Right, Tommy. Right, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, but, you know, as you say, though, uh, economic progress makes for challenges. Yeah. And, uh, and then you have all these historical things swirling around in Southeast Asia. And uh, Vietnam has a, has a history of being strong, sometimes dealing with adversities it shouldn't have to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, but, but here we are, and it's rising to the top of the heap mm. in, in Southeast Asia. It's quite amazing. And so this takes us to your comments uh, on Thursday mm -hmm. about uh, Sino-Vietnamese relations. Uh, obviously, China is, you know, dominating that, that whole area and wants to and will continue to, uh, and it will have an effect on every country that you can imagine. Um, and so I, I, I ask you, I'm sorry I wasn't there, mm -hmm. but I ask you now, what effect is China having on Vietnam? And twirled in there is, is that different than the effect the United States is having on Vietnam. Huh? Yeah, okay. What effect is China having on Vietnam? Um, you know, you said, you know, Vietnam is rising as a, as a power in the region, and that's definitely the case. Um, if the population is nearing 100 million, mm. I don't know what percentage yeah. of that is below 30, but it's enormous. Mm. There's no other country like that uh, in Asia. Um, no, there, there talk are, about vitality. Like Indonesia and things like that. Uh, they, they have quite a young population, Indonesia and Afghanistan, but Vietnamese population are in that young group, yes. And there's, but there's something about the mm. dynam dynamism, dynamism and the dynamism of mm. that economy and the mix mm. of all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, if you're looking, if you're another country in the region, mm. 
you, I would be nervous about Vietnam, not in a threatening way, but that is competition. That is something you know that you really have to think about, and um, you know, I think that works both to Vietnam's advantage and against it. In that, it, it could be difficult to get close allies when you're the big rising superstar and you need the help of people who are a little smaller than you. Uh, then you've got big China, the big U.S. And what do you do in those situations? And at present, I think uh, what, say, like the government tries to do is to deal with both of them and to not lean too far in any one direction, uh, not really, not necessarily play them off each other, but realize you've got to live with both. You can't really rely on anyone out there. And so it's a kind of a, a balancing act and a, and a way just to, you know, keep as many connections as possible and, and don't go too far with any of so them. It strikes me that Vietnam is well, historically well prepared to deal with that because it's had to do that balancing act sometimes more successfully than other times over the over the last 100, 150 years of its history. Uh, yeah. I, mean, uh, I mean, as an historian, you know, these are all the, these kind of, um, you know, big uh, sorry, I'm, generalities I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm are the type of things we deconstruct. <laughs> and so, um, you know, the, the historian in me is going, oh, yeah, no, no, uh, it's a lot more complex than that. Um, in reality, I don't think there's really any kind of past knowledge or anything that the that anyone can rely on. And but one point I brought up in the talk that I, that's really interesting that people I think don't really realize is, in a place like Vietnam, there's a mandatory retirement age, and it's 60 for men and 55 for women. Even and, though we are trying to change it, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah. right. And so that means you have tremendous change in society. And so if you think about it, let's say you rise to the top of your, you know, department or agency when you're 56, you do one term and then you have to step aside because you've hit the retirement age. And what I think that means is that if, even though you might want to maintain the same, say, say policy or strategy, it's going to change with younger people coming in every few years. Yeah. And so, you know, this idea that, that's why I'm, I'm kind of playing off this idea that they have experience to build on, that experience is disappearing and changing. Because of the changes. Every five years, you, you know, know what I mean? They used to say, this is a little French, sure. they used to say, plus ça change, plus la même. <laughs> okay. Now they say, plus ça change, Plus ça change. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we take a short break. We're okay. going to come back and we're going to get in the details on this. Okay. We'll be right back. Okay. Minasan, konnichiwa. Think Tech Hawaii ga Nihongo de otodoke suru. Konnichiwa Hawaii no Nihongo Hoso no Kosto, Kunisue Yukari des. 各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミュニティ、ハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは、ハワイ。各週の月曜日2時からぜひ
And yeah, you know, there, there are things that happen and people talk about Vietnam as being the closest American ally in Southeast Asia and things like that. Mm. Um, it is very close, but like I was saying before, um, Viet, I think like the Vietnamese government, for, for instance, knows not to put too many eggs in one basket. And so it's very close, but other relationships are close as well. This sounds so, like India. Right. right. Know, it's oh, it's, yeah, a, sure, it's yeah. a concept of independence. Right. Uh, we like you, but you're not our, our only, you know, the only girl in our dance card. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but also, as I briefly mentioned before, um, there have been a lot of uh, educational collaborations and exchange between Vietnam and the United States. And uh, up until now, the United States appears to be the most popular destination for Vietnamese students. Mm -hmm. And um, not just at the higher education level, but at school level. So more and more young Vietnamese have been sent to the United States mm -hmm. for schools. Well, indeed. I yeah, mean, you look so, at any city in the country right, yeah. and you find Vietnamese immigrants everywhere. Yeah. Oh, and actually, a lot of them now are not immigrants. They are, uh, they are actually international students mm -hmm. from Vietnam. Yeah. And um, their parents uh, are economically viable, mm -hmm. stable, and then they, they can sponsor, they can support their kids' education yeah. in the United States. Yeah, and, and, and the yeah. U.S. is going to Vietnam. The U.S. As is well. traveling. A lot of people are yes. doing tourism. The, uh, mm. the Shidla School sure. has yeah, a substantial so business sure. school, mm -hmm. and they say, I like your opinion on this, mm -hmm. they say that, what is it, one in four CEOs in, in, Vietnam. in Vietnam is has gone to a program at the Shidla School in Ho Chi Minh City. Is that true? I haven't heard that statistic, I'm not sure. Um, but I, I mean, to follow that, I mean, yes, that program has been there for years now, right? And there's and it many has people. Good reputation, right? yes. Um, mm. But um, if we just look at universities, though, you've got um, Australia has a university there. There's um, Germany and Japan have both set up kind of joint universities. Uh, there's the Fulbright University, which is being, uh, you know, developed. Recently, there's a new university that's been announced that is essentially um, being supported by a conglomerate of what was originally Vietnamese workers who were sent to um, the Eastern Bloc, but then who stayed on after the, the Soviet Union collapsed, became successful there, came back to Vietnam and invested. They're building an entire new university and are asking Cornell, Cornell. and I think UPenn as well, perhaps, mm -hmm. to consult in the construction of this. Mm -hmm. So it's everyone is involved, yeah. you know, in, at that level. How has the Trump isolationist, um, I don't know if he's always isolationist, maybe that's changing, but how has the Trump foreign policy uh, been played out in Vietnam? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I mean, if, if you, so for example, if you, I can only comment from um, what I am a little bit familiar with. So um, I have heard a lot of concerns uh, from prospective Vietnamese students who may want to go to the United States to study because they are concerned about their visa being rejected. And at the same time, I have also heard a lot of um, stories from Vietnamese students who are currently in the United States who feel nervous to go home uh, for a holiday mm. because they don't want to yeah, get yeah, yeah. 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 So, so things like that. Um, and at the same time, there have also been, I don't know, accounts from um, Vietnamese people who have been in the United States for a long time, but suddenly feel that they are not welcome to stay. And to stay here. Yeah, to stay here, right. And so, of course, that somehow affect um, the perception and, um, yeah, f uh, people inside Vietnam. So, yes, yeah, so things, there are things like that going on. And at the same time, I have also seen some solidarity between different groups of Vietnamese, both inside and outside of Vietnam, to support those Vietnamese uh, inside the U.S. who are at the receiving end of the policy. Yeah, and yes, so, this is interesting yeah. in view of the fact that after the Vietnam War, mm. the, um, the Vietnamese who were in the United States, there was a certain disdain mm. by, by the Vietnamese who were in Vietnam, who stayed in Vietnam, 
and the Vietnamese who had left and settled in. Right? Am I right about that? Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, um, but again, I mean, that I kind of touched on that in the talk as well, right? That is something mm -hmm. that has changed over time as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are certainly more solidarity. Yeah, there's certainly that. animosities that still exist, but there's also more solidarity, solidarity that still exists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and new forms of collaboration. Yeah. You know, as I, I was saying in the talk, go into any, not any, but go into a hip restaurant in Saigon, and there are lots of them, and there's a good chance that there's a overseas Vietnamese who's behind that as they've brought back, you know, um, ingenuity, technology. They're returning. Sure, oh, yeah. plenty of people. Because oh, I mean, it's a good place to return to. Their, their economic <laughs> vibrancy so. is, is wonderful, you know, yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, yeah. Mm. And, uh, yeah. So let's turn to China for a minute, you know. China, one belt, one road. China obviously trying to in increase its influence everywhere in every continent, and certainly everywhere along the one belt, one road right into the heart of Europe. They're actually building things in the heart of Europe and in Africa. Um, how has that affected Vietnam so far? Uh, and what, what, how, does that, how has that changed the perception of Vietnam, the people, the government, toward China? And indirectly, how has it affected their, mm, their relationships, their perception of the United States as a future partner? Mm -hmm. The world is changing. I absolutely agree, totally mm -hmm. agree. And the question is, uh, uh, what about the changes between China and the U.S.? So um, the thing I, one of the things I brought up in the, my talk was that while we have this sense today that there's always been this animosity between Vietnam and China, in reality, the big turning point was 1979. There was a border war, actually a series of, of uh, conflicts at that time. And the relationships just took a massive nosedive. And in the aftermath of that was this incredible anti-Chinese, you know, sentiment. And that, you know, that lasted for a while, and things have smoothed out. But it's like you have this scar there, and now you're trying to interact and not open that scar again. And so while on the one hand, there are plenty of ways that um, China can invest in Vietnam, Vietnamese can go and study in China, and, and everything is fine. But if there's some kind of conflict that emerges, it's not all that difficult for that scar to, you know, open again. And so I think that Ch China is very careful about how it, um, about what it does in Vietnam, perhaps not unlike the way that Japan uh, was with Southeast Asia after World War II. They went back in and invested but did it very carefully and quietly and didn't, Respectfully. You know, and respectfully, right? Yeah. It didn't try to, you know, um, draw too much attention to themselves. And uh, for instance, you know, we were talking about how at these, there was a recent APEC meeting mm. in um, Vietnam, yeah, yeah. Mm. and all of the global leaders went out into the streets, Putin, Trump, right, everyone. Xi Jinping just stayed back in his hotel. And I think it's, there's a, there's a nervousness about the relationship, you know, and or you may, might have another a view of it, but um, there's a lot of interaction that's going, but they're also careful, both sides, I think, not to, you know, draw too much attention to this. Wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. and actually, um, related to your question about one belt, one vote, right? So, um, one of my research interests is inter the internationalization of higher education in global context. So through that research, I have been working with a lot of colleagues, actually from China, based on different uh, based at different Chinese universities as well as Chinese scholars working in the UK or in Australia, for example. And so we have been talking about a lot, you know, with each other a lot about that new uh, ambition from China. And to my surprise, actually, my my colleagues are often surprised, uh, you know, often get surprised that how come you know so much about China? We don't seem to know much about Vietnam at all. <laughs> and then, well, it dawns on me, hmm, why is it that? And then I realize that, you know. It's just all the way some, something, like since we were small, somehow we, we always read and are, tend to be very curious about what China does. Yeah. But a lot of my, even my own students from China, <clears throat> they don't seem to pay much attention. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. That's so true, I really yeah. don't know. <laughs> but yeah. um, at the talk, there was someone who brought up mm -hmm. a comment, which is true, which is that at Vietnamese universities, there are no professors of Chinese history. 
So Vietnamese know lots about China. They learn a lot about it, mm. but officially, there's no one there teaching uh, Chinese history. A little bit of an edge there. Really interesting, and there's probably yeah. the same case in China. I don't know if there's any positions of Vietnamese history anywhere. Mm -hmm. It could be. I'm not yeah, sure. A little bit, I yeah. Know. Yeah, but I that, can. That, that shows you the kind of the um, the nuances of this relationship. It's they're close together. They're essentially the governments are allies, but. It's not they, the visibility of it is kept, you know, well, that, at a kind of control. That goes to my level. last question because we're almost out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, finally, how let me ask you my question first: mm -hmm. Where is this going? Where is Vietnam going? Where is its relationship with the U.S. going? Where is its relationship with China going? Um, I I want to see <laughs> uh, Vietnam and China, or Vietnam and the U.S. Um, to be great friends and great um, collaborators with each other. Definitely, that is why I would love to see. And actually, I've seen a lot of evidence um, to support my hope. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I learned Chinese in Taiwan. I lived a total of six years in Taiwan, um, which has this very odd relationship with mainland China. Um, and what I've learned from that is ambiguity ha is really tenacious. Ambiguity can last a long time. You heard time. it here. <laughs> ambiguity is tenacious. And so my uh, prediction, I'm a historian, I only predict about the past. Of but, course. Uh, and predicting about the future, I think just this same kind of being in the middle, balancing everything, not going too much in any direction. That's the way it'll it'll keep going. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and maybe just one last part to add to your question. So, I have been um, researching into the impact of the role of English as a, a global language in in global context, yeah, including yeah. Vietnam. And at the moment, I'm looking at the influence of Chinese as one of the world's dominant languages. In Asia, yeah, yes. So I think I hope that maybe by this time next year, if you bring me back to the show, I would have more to comment on. Yeah. So if I go to Ho Chi Minh City <laughs> right now, will I will I hear Chinese on the street? Oh, um, not on the street, but definitely a lot of students, young students, yeah, now they learn yeah, Chinese. Yeah. So at our conference last year, actually, yeah. I was surprised to see so many but young. I'll hear students. a lot more English. Yeah. Uh, English, well, a yes. lot of people are learning a language in addition to English. Yes, right? yes, yeah. so yeah. more and more. It's part of yeah. globalization. Sure, I think. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Le Ha, Fan Le Ha. Yes. Uh, again. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Le Ha, yes. Okay. <laughs> thank you. And Liam Kelly, thank you so much for coming well, yeah. down. Thank you. Yeah. Great thank to you talk so to you. Much. I hope we can thank do this you. again. Yes, yeah. sure. Great to talk yep. to you. It's thank very you. important that we study this subject.